Hello everybody, welcome to the final in our Cactus webinars of uh, 2020. Uh, I'm Christina Silva and I'm joined today by my colleague Sarah Bullock uh, in hosting uh, this webinar. Before we get started with the main event, uh, I just wanted to uh, remind you that we have already got some really exciting webinars scheduled for next year. We've got seven uh, on the books already. Uh, and they're available uh, to book from our Eventbrite pages. Uh, and uh, you'll also be able to access uh, recordings of today's session and previous and forthcoming sessions from our YouTube channel. Also, just to remind you that our uh, online training uh, is all subject to various uh, discounts at the moment. We've got a couple of sessions coming up before Christmas uh, and many more scheduled for the new year. Uh, so do check out our websites uh, for various information about all of those bits and pieces. However, on to the topic of today, which is transcription as an analytic act. I'm uh, very delighted to introduce you to Dr. David Woods, who's the lead developer of Transana, and he's based in Madison, Wisconsin in the United States, which is where he's joining us from today. Please do ask questions at any time during the session using the Q&A area of Teams. And myself and Sarah will collate your questions and ask David uh, your um, questions at relevant moments during the session and also at the end. Before I hand over to David, I, let me tell you a little bit more about him. So David has a bachelor's degree with honors in psychology and a PhD uh, from the School of Education and Social P Policy, both from Northwestern University. He was in practice for more than a decade as a psychologist, and he has been a software developer since 1980. He's developed Transana as a tool for the analysis of video, audio, and text data since the year 2000. David has three adult children, and he lives with his wife and his four cats, and apparently there's an occasional influx of foster kittens to keep things lively around the place. In his free time, David enjoys kayaking, uh, the lakes and rivers of Wisconsin. He does gravestone repair and restoration in historic cemeteries, and he spends Monday evenings solving complex puzzles with his longtime gaming group. David is also a longtime friend of the Cactus Networking Project, and we're really looking forward to hearing him talk today about the really important task of transcription in qualitative research. So, David, with great pleasure, I'd like to hand over to you. All right, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, I'm sure my cats will be quite pleased to hear that they made it into the introduction. Um, uh, all right, today's topic is the transcription as an analytic act. Um, uh, so I'm gonna focus primarily on, uh, uh, on the act of transcribing and how that makes a difference uh, as one goes through the process of qualitative analysis. Um, so we'll start with what is a transcript? I use a really broad definition of transcript when I talk about it. A transcript is any written record that corresponds in some way with a media file, either an audio file or a video file. Um, uh, so, uh, so I'm a firm believer that in the pursuit of analysis, we need a really broad definition uh, of transcripts. One of the things that uh, makes a transcript more useful is when that transcript is linked somehow to the media file so that as the media file plays, the relevant section of the transcript uh, is highlighted uh, and also so that you can locate an interesting passage in the transcript and use the transcript as a way of jumping to the relevant section of the media file. Uh, that is uh, uh, one of the ways that a transcript can be really, really helpful during analysis. Um, uh, and uh, uh, it's also important to understand what a transcript is not. A transcript is not your data. I'm doing a literature review for an analysis I'm working on right now, and article after article after article says, we recorded the interviews and we got the transcripts and we threw the media files away and analyzed the transcripts. And I just find that maddening because you lose so much detail, you lose so much richness uh, when you throw away the media file and just focus on the transcript. So uh, the way I see it is you've got reality out there. You cannot capture reality. 
for your analysis, unfortunately. So you go to either video recording or audio recording as the next best step. But that's an abstraction of the reality because the camera's only pointed at certain things and the microphone only has a certain area that, that it captures. Uh, and so you lose some resolution in that process. But then you take the next step and go to creating a written representation of what you've captured in your media data. That's another level more abstract and there's another loss of resolution that goes on there. So it's important to recognize that the transcript really, it isn't your data, it's a representation of your data that has less information in it. Uh, and in my mind, one of the main functions of a transcript is that it serves as a map to your data to allow you to find the bits that are interesting, to easily interact with it, to be able to uh, see at a glance what's going on uh, in a more convenient way, but it is not a replacement for your data. And so I'm just going to jump over here to Transana for a second because uh, I, I want to uh, sort of hammer that point home. So what I've got here is a set of six clips. And as you can see, the text for each of these six clips is absolutely identical. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. I would argue that that is quite misleading. These six clips are in fact not identical with each other. Uh, so let me just show you a couple of them. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Excellent. So there's one version of that. Next version. Same text, looks exactly the same if you just have a transcript. Hello. My name is Anita Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Hello! My name is Anita Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. So my basic argument is that without Without being able to link to the media file, without being able to go to the media file to check it, you miss the differences between those three clips. So it's really important to recognize that the transcript is your, your point of access to the media file. It is not a replacement for it. Uh, it is important to recognize that all transcripts require making analytic decisions. It is never a good idea to say to somebody on your team, go ahead and make me transcripts. You have to give them more instruction than that, uh, particularly if you're hiring cheap undergraduate labor, uh, as some of us have been known to do. You need to provide structure to let them know uh, uh, what's important about your transcripts so that they can make the right analytic decisions as they go um, uh, because uh, there is more to transcribing than simply capturing the words, um, which is one of the reasons that uh, automated transcription is less than ideal, as we'll get into uh, uh, in the future. Uh, another way of, uh, of uh, another important thing about this particular point is I would actually encourage everyone who's listening to spend some time transcribing at least a little bit of your own data for every project that you, uh, that you um, are involved in because you gain an intimacy with your data during the act of transcription that you can't get any other way. Uh, and you will see things about your data, you will learn things about your data during the act of creating text-based representations of it that, uh, that can be very valuable to being able to make sense out of that data in the long run. Uh, now, it's not always possible to do all of your own transcription. I certainly recognize that. I don't do all of my own transcription when I'm doing analyses. <coughs> but I would encourage you to do at least some to get a feel for your data in that very close way. Um, it's also really important to recognize that a transcript is a living thing that can and will change with repeated viewing of the media. This to me is one of the fundamental differences between working with media files and working with text only data is that with text only data, the text is the data, it doesn't change you can rely on it being the same all the time, but the more times you listen to a passage of, of media, 
the more subtlety you're going to notice, the more uh, uh, you're going to notice things in it on the 30th viewing or the 100th viewing that you didn't notice in the first, uh, the first few viewings. Uh, and you'll change your transcript to reflect that. So the expectation that the text will change with time, with repeated views of the video, repeated listening to the audio, uh, uh, is something fundamental to working with media data that I think is really quite important and that doesn't get quite enough uh, attention. It is important to note that a transcript can affect how you see the video. It actually, uh, it's more than just uh, a set of words. And again, uh, I want to demonstrate that with a quick sample. What would you do if I said how to Will you stand up and walk out on me? Lend me your ears and I'll sing you a song. <coughs> I will try not to sing out of key. Yeah. Oh, baby, have you back? I'm sure that's exactly what the sheet music looks like, right? But as you listen to that video carefully, that transcript comes frighteningly close to what you actually hear. I will never be able to listen to that song the same way again, having seen this particular transcription uh, of uh, the song. Now, I take no credit for it myself. It's something I found on YouTube, but I think it makes the point that what you read affects how you see the video, how you understand the video. Uh, and that is something that we can take advantage of, uh, as you'll see in a few slides. So the main thing that I want to talk about today is that there are many, many different kinds of transcripts that one can use analytically. Uh, different types of transcripts serve different analytic functions. They can be used for different reasons to enhance the analytic process in a variety of different ways. And so that's really where I want to focus most today, is to talk about the different kinds of transcripts that one can choose to use and some of the advantages of the different kinds. So let's start with that you can analyze media data without transcribing at all. Uh, the vast majority of qualitative pro programs give you a way of marking directly on a media file uh, and, and applying coding to the selections that you make without creating a transcript at all. Uh, and that is no transcript is uh, absolutely a valid analytic choice. Uh, it's best when you're planning on going through the video just or audio data just once, giving it uh, codes uh, in a way that's fairly quick and, and moving on, not really coming back to revisit that data in the future. Uh, it's particularly useful if you're on a very tight budget or have really limited time. Uh, so if you need to do a sort of quick and dirty analysis of some data, skipping the step of transcription makes a lot of sense. Um, 
Uh, so it's for analysis where the emphasis is on speed rather than analytic depth of the data. Um, it's really, really fast initially. Not transcribing takes a lot less time than transcribing does. Um, but it's also important to recognize that once you've got all of this coded data together, you have to watch every clip every time to be able to remember what's in that clip uh, and why you coded it a particular way. So it ends up taking longer in the long run than people give it credit for, uh, because there is that trade-off that when you have a transcript and therefore have text representations of the contents of the media file later in the analytic process when you've got your selections uh, coded and you're working with them to, to make sense of that analysis, um, having that text representation can save you time down the road from having to refer back to the media every single time. So uh, there are some time savings, some money savings up front, but those are going to be less than one would imagine in the long run because of how it slows things down later in the analytic process. Uh, you can work with minimal transcripts, with gisting. Uh, um, so that's basically where you go through and you create rough segments of your data. You do some, make some decisions about what bits of data hang together and make sense as analytic units. Uh, and you make brief notes about what's most important about each of these segments. So let me show you uh, an example of that. So what I'm doing is opening a pair of transcripts here. On the left is a gisted transcript. On the right is a verbatim transcript of the same data. Uh, and so you can see uh, what the gisted transcript is like on in the left-hand column. Let me play a little bit of this video for you to, to be able to see how that works. This is the core they started with. And they want it to look like that. I'm going to first flip it up. Watch what happens. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to where we started. And now I'm going to flip it down. Hmm. What happens each time? It goes, it's the same. It's the same. It goes to the same flipping thing. Flipping it up. Or flipping. Oh, do you think we have to test it on their course first? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, now are they the same? The yeah. Yeah. No? I'm going to flip this one up. Maybe. Hey, okay, I'm going to flip that one up and I'm going to flip this one down. Same. What is the same? Okay. What did we find out? Same. Yeah. So from now on, if someone's going to, if you want me to flip it up or down, what we call that is an up down flip. We don't call it an up flip. We don't call it a down flip. We call it an up down flip because that shows people we're talking to that we know. Doesn't matter if you flip it up or if you flip it down, you get the same result. So, so you can see that the transcript on the left allows you enough information to know roughly what part of the video you're, video you're looking at, what part of the data is referred to in each segment. Uh, it assumes that you have at least some familiarity with the with the data that you've watched the video file through once. But you can see that uh, that you can get a sense of what each section is about. And it takes much less time to create this sort of gisted transcript uh, uh, than it does to create the full-blown uh, verbatim transcript. So it is considerably faster. Uh, and given that, it, uh, that uh, it usually costs some amount of money to create transcripts, it is usually cheaper. Uh, but it does take that first step towards allowing you to find sections of the video based on what you've written. Uh, and so this is uh, particularly if you're in a situation where you're bringing a large amount of media data uh, in for analysis, uh, you know, if you've got 15 or 20 or 100 or 200 hours worth of, uh, of data that you're bringing into software all at once, uh, you can consider this maybe as a first step or maybe as a good enough step uh, to be able to get through a large amount of material uh, and to start building those maps that allow you to uh, 
uh, allow you to find what you're looking for in that data when it comes time for that. Um, uh, people uh, take field notes while they are recording their data. And if you have field notes, I strongly encourage you to put those field notes into your analytic software as a transcript. You've taken those notes for a reason. You've taken those notes as things were happening and being recorded. So there is that underlying timeline <coughs> so that you can link those field notes, uh, segments of the field notes to segments of the video as uh, different parts of uh, the events are unfolding uh, that you're observing. Uh, and so you can link those field notes to the media data that help you make those field notes more useful. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I've certainly had the experience of looking through my field notes and finding a particular section and, and sort of scratching my head and trying to remember exactly what I meant by a particular phrase that I wrote <coughs> or wanting to go back and see that part of the data. And so uh, so being able to click on the field notes, load the, the recording underneath of each section of the field notes allows me to make those field notes much richer, allows me to connect better to that underlying data um, using the field notes. Um, so I encourage people to use field notes as one of their transcripts. Uh, there's a process of partial transcription, uh, and that is uh, simply where you uh, go through your data and you transcribe the bits that are going to be important to your analysis uh, and you do either no transcription or minimal transcription of the parts of the data that you record that are not important to your analysis because you're never going to have a situation where 100% of what you record is absolutely vital uh, to any given analysis that you're doing. Um, uh, and so it can be uh, uh, efficient to do partial transcription to go in and transcribe surgically. Uh, this is particularly useful uh, for uh, analytic activities that involve Jeffersonian transcription, which is a sort of more intense version of transcription that we'll talk about in partial transcription to go in and transcribe surgically. Uh, this is particularly useful uh, for uh, analytic activities that involve Jeffersonian transcription, which is a sort of more intense version of transcription that we'll talk about in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, that can be quite uh, time consuming to produce. And so a lot of people who are doing conversation analysis or discourse analysis will do partial transcription uh, to avoid having to do really, really intense transcription over uh, huge amounts of data. Um, and uh, as would be obvious, partial transcription saves time over full transcription. Um, but it's important to recognize that there is a risk of missing some important material if your initial decisions about which parts of the data to transcribe are imperfect. So it is uh, important to keep in mind if you're doing partial transcription uh, that it's worth reviewing some of the material that you didn't transcribe later in the analytic process just to make sure that you didn't miss something important because you didn't recognize it was important when you did your initial uh, decisions about what to transcribe and what not to transcribe. Uh, we're now finally getting to verbatim transcription, which is the most common uh, type of transcription that people engage in. Um, uh, verbatim transcription is the process of you type what you hear. Um, um, uh, but it's important to recognize that it's never that simple. You can go into less detail or more detail as you're listening. Human speech is never as clear as what you read in a book. There are people who use ums and uhs. There are people who repeat words or who start a sentence one way and then uh, interrupt it and go a totally different direction. Uh, the flow of hu human conversation is not smooth. Uh, and it is an analytic decision how much of that uh, lack of smoothness you want to reflect in your transcript. If somebody repeats words, for example, for some analyses, that's a waste of time to reflect it on that level. For other analyses, 
it's really important to know where somebody is struggling with a concept or to know uh, when somebody is is caught on something and seeing those sorts of details in a more detailed transcript can be important. So you need to decide for a given project how much detail you want to reflect in a ver even within a verbatim transcript uh, so that you can make a decision about uh, uh, about the level of transcription that you want to go into, recognizing that the more detail you put in, the longer it's going to take, but the richer the transcript is going to be. Um, uh, verbatim transcripts can make difficult passages clearer. Uh, if you have, uh, uh, I've done a lot of work with classroom video where there's a lot of overtalk, a lot of simultaneous speech, and you can often take a, a piece that's difficult to hear and make it clearer through transcription. Uh, if you have uh, imperfect uh, video or audio, you can you know, crank the volume up or listen to a passage multiple times and get it typed out clearly in a way that you might not be able to hear it each time. Uh, and that clarity allows you to pursue things analytically uh, in a way that's easier. Um, uh, a verbatim transcript makes your media data searchable in a way that video itself is not searchable so that you can go to a transcript you can type in a word or phrase you can find that word or phrase and therefore uh, focus in on that part of the media and so it's tremendously useful uh, in that way as a tool to finding what you're looking for if you remember there was a place where they were talking about this particular concept and they used this particular phrase to describe it you can search your data for that phrase uh, and get to the part that you're looking for <coughs> uh, in a way that's that's easier. Uh, it allows you to do things like word counts and word clouds of your data as a way of seeing what language your participants are using, what concepts or ideas are they bringing up repeatedly, where are they focusing a lot of their energy and a lot of their talk. Um, uh, word counts and word clouds can be really uh, convenient in terms of getting you to what is most important in understanding the way that your participants are talking about particular topics and which topics are most important to them. Uh, and verbatim transcripts allow you access to tools like word counts and word clouds. Uh, and it's important to recognize that these transcripts take time to create. The typical figures I hear is that it's about three and a half to four and a half hours uh, per hour of video to create a moderately detailed uh, verbatim transcript. Um, so transcription can be a time consuming process, but it gives you a number of advantages. And again, let's hop back to Transana. We can close that and let's just focus for a second on the verbatim transcript. And you can see that this particular transcript has some level of detail in it. They want it to look like that. I'm going to first flip it up. Watch what happens. Okay. Now I'm going to go back to where we started, and now I'm going to flip it down. Hmm. What happens each time? It goes, it's, it goes to the same thing. Flipping it up. Or flipping. Oh, I think we have to test it on there, of course, Greg. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, now, are they the same? When yeah. You know? yeah. I'm going to flip this one up. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to flip that one up. So you can see that this particular transcript tries to do things like give you a sense of how many students are answering the teacher at one time. It gives you a sense of where uh, the what the teacher saying and what a student saying overlap with each other. Uh, you can see that it includes, you know, ha huh and hmm and some of those non-word uh, phrases that go into speech. Um, uh, I'm going to flip this one up. Maybe hmm, there. I'm going to flip it up. So you can see by looking at that bit of the transcript that she actually uh, had a little bit of a uh, of an issue getting uh, getting the square flipped the way she wanted to. So you can start to see that level of detail even in the transcript. Uh, and I talked before about being able to find things in the transcript. I know in this lesson. In this lesson, uh, there's a discussion of symmetry, and the word symmetry is something that comes up. Well, I can type in 
a portion of that word to the search. And I can, okay, there they're talking about symmetry, there they're uh, introducing it. Um, uh, and, uh, and so here's the part that uh, I'm looking for for this part of the analysis. Let's talk about that word, symmetrical. Who can share um, share with the group? What do you think, what do you, what's your guess? What do you think it might have to do with? Paul, what's your guess? So this is where uh, they've come across a new word in a story that the teacher was reading. And instead of telling the kids what that word means, she asks them what it means, uh, which is uh, an interesting move with, uh, uh, with kids this young. And you go on and can get to that particular part of the lesson and see how that whole process goes by being able to do the text search in a verbatim transcript um, in a way that if you don't have uh, a verbatim transcript or in a way that if you have just uh, a gisted transcript, it can be harder to find the passage that you're looking for. And no amount of scanning through video, looking at the visuals is going to get you to a place where all of your video is a bunch of kids in a classroom and you want to find where they're talking about a particular issue or, or concept. Um, but again, it's important to recognize with the verbatim transcript that you have lost a level of detail. You've lost inflection. You've lost emphasis. You've lost uh, uh, gesture or body posture or facial expression. There's so many different elements that go into understanding the meaning of what someone has said that the verbatim transcript doesn't capture, but it is still a useful tool at getting you to those bits of the media so that you can then pick up those other elements as well. So beware of the temptation to stop listening to your audio, to stop watching your video because you have it there in text, because it's important to recognize that that text is an imperfect representation. Um, so automated transcription. Uh, as somebody who writes qualitative software, this is a question I get uh, a lot. Will your program transcribe for me? It's often followed by in Portuguese or in uh, in uh, Greek or whatever. Well, speech recognition is a really promising technology. And by that, I mean that my entire life they have been promising us that technology will be really working well in just a few years. It still doesn't work well. Um, speech recognition requires really good audio quality. And sometimes you can get that. If you're doing interviews, for example, you can get really pretty good audio quality. If you're doing something out in the field, in a classroom or on a playground or uh, in so many other settings, audio quality is going to be questionable at best. Uh, the, the, the best speech recognition uh, programs claim up to 95% accuracy. Uh, the key of that is up to, I typically get about 80% accuracy if I'm doing well with those kinds of programs, I have not actually seen evidence of something approaching 95% accuracy uh, with them. Um, uh, voice recognition struggles with punctuation or doesn't do punctuation at all, depending on uh, the program. You get no speaker identifiers, you get no white space, you get no formatting, you get no organization. Uh, uh, and so it's uh, kind of hit or miss depending on the particular program. Let me just pull up uh, an example here. So this is a bit of, uh, of audio data. What we have on the left is what a voice recognition program heard in this audio. This is a BBC News piece. So it's very good quality audio. Uh, so on the left is what the voice recognition program gave me. On the right is what I typed up in Transana. The Guardian. The Observer's business editor is Heather Stewart. She says King, in effect, attacked the government's borrowing policy. He certainly did. I think this is potentially pretty explosive stuff. There's a convention that the Bank of England doesn't talk directly about fiscal policy, just as the, the Treasury is now not really meant to pontificate on the subject of where interest rates should be. And yet King made a very direct intervention. He said, if the economy recovers as rapidly as the government expected it to in, in its 
budget forecasts that the deficit should be cut back. In other words, that public spending should be cut faster than the Treasury envisages. And, and this is politically very uh, explosive territory because Gordon Brown is very keen to paint the next election as a battle between uh, a Labour Party that would continue to, to hold levels of investment, public spending quite high. And so my experience of that particular voice recognition transcript is that it's given me gibberish. It's gotten some of the words right, but there's no sense of coherence at all. There's a whole bunch that it's left out. And again, this is good quality audio, professionally recorded. Uh, um, yes, the people had what voice recognition might consider uh, an accent, although I suspect that many of the people who are attending this webinar would argue that I'm the one who has the accent rather than the speakers in that uh, in that audio. Um, uh, and I just, I've not had a good experience. I've tried a variety of different platforms. Some do better than others. Um, uh, it takes a, a bit of experiment, um, uh, but, uh, but I generally find that it is actually faster for me to transcribe from scratch than it is to run something through voice recognition and take the time to correct it and turn it into something useful. It's actually faster to skip that step for me at this point. And I really do hope that there are promises of the technology change uh, in the next few years, but we're not there yet. Um, it, it's just not uh, not up to snuff uh, in my experience. Um, uh, another issue with with uh, another issue with automated uh, uh, transcripts is time codes. Is the linking of uh, of the transcript to the media file, and I've had very very varying experiences with that. That some programs uh, give you time data more frequently than others. Some actually time code every word, which uh, is too much. Some don't time code at all, which is not enough. Uh, I've rarely seen things come out with a good balance, but there's always going to be that process of actually linking the transcript to the media file that is so important for uh, analysis. Um, another issue that comes up is that there are data confidentiality concerns that there are a number of services out there. You submit your file to them and they return uh, their best guess at the transcript to you. Um, I definitely check with your IRB before you use any of those services because uh, if it's at all Google related, then you know that Google is keeping a copy of that data, sucking it in, using it to, uh, uh, to add to their vast database of uh, what they know about uh, you as an individual customer, because uh, because so much on Google is free, you're not the customer, you're the product. Uh, and so there are serious concerns about confidentiality for some of those services, um, not all of them, but some of them. Uh, and definitely check with your IRB before you send your data out to some kind of service to get an automated transcript. Um, uh, what I will say about speech recognition is that there's a process called parroting or echoing that actually works pretty well, that you listen to uh, your media file and you then reflect back. Um, uh, you listen to it and then you speak into your microphone to voice recognition software that's trained to your particular voice. It's always your voice. It's always the good quality audio between you and your microphone right there. Uh, and using this parroting or echoing technique, people can get an hour's worth of media transcribed into something pretty reasonable in about two hours, hour and 45 minutes, two hours and 15 minutes, something in that range. Uh, so if you want to use voice recognition technology, it's not going to be the magic that you hope it is, but it is something that can be used along the way. Uh, and both Windows and Mac OS have built in speech recognition software that actually works reasonably well for this sort of parroting process. So that is something that you can consider uh, in, uh, in moving forward with your analysis. Uh, I'm noticing here that I'm way behind time, so I'm gonna try and move through these next couple of points a little bit more quickly. Um, uh, translation is an important type of transcript. I was working with uh, a project in Luxembourg uh, and what they did was they were recording uh, 
children in, in the first year of school together. And what they were seeing was that about half of the kids spoke German and a third of the kids spoke French and a couple of kids in each class spoke Portuguese. And there was this one kid in each grade who spoke Luxembourgish, which I didn't even know was a language until I got involved with this project. Uh, and so the first year of school is really spent with the kids learning to talk to each other because they all speak different languages. Uh, and really interesting linguistic things go on as the kids learn to talk to each other and they might take a German noun and use the German grammatical structure of tacking additional words onto the end of it to serve as adjectives, but they might choose a French word and a Portuguese word to describe a particular thing in a way that cannot be done in any one of the languages spoken in that classroom. Uh, and one of the issues that they had was that not all of the researchers spoke all of the languages uh, uh, going on in the classroom. So the way they solved that was that they had an, a natural language transcript, a transcript that reflected whatever language was spoken, but then they had an all German transcript and they had an all French transcript. And uh, sometimes it was a Spanish transcript or an English transcript that they added onto that to provide access to that data for people who didn't speak uh, some of the languages in the data that they were recording. Uh, and so having languages uh, uh, in, uh, in multiple translations for the data uh, provided access to people who didn't speak the languages and proved a really interesting way to study languages because one of the things that they found was that there wasn't a decent way of expressing in German some idea that was uh, that came up that was in a different language uh, or whatever and so it proved to be a very interesting study of what languages did well or poorly uh, and where the challenges arose in representing what was said in different languages. Uh, and so translations uh, can be a really interesting way of studying language uh, that can be handled via multiple transcripts. Um, there are lots of different kinds of visual or descriptive or gestural or notational systems that one can create to capture different aspects of uh, of what is going on, um, uh, ways of representing different aspects of the data. Um, so here, for example, uh, early on, uh, uh, when I was still in a single transcript mode of thinking, uh, here's an attempt to capture gesture and speech in the same transcript. The moment that made me switch from a PC to a Mac. I'm sleeping. I have to. And what you can see from that is that by trying to make the segments around the gestures, because the gestures were smaller and more frequent than than the words, that in fact it becomes really difficult to work with this transcript as a verbal transcript. It becomes really hard to work with the content of what's going on. Uh, and what I found was that by splitting the two, um, let's close that one, by dividing it into two transcripts, the one on the left being a verbal transcript, the one on the right being a gestural transcript, I was able to do a couple of things. First off, you can work with the verbal transcript to get the verbal aspect of what's going on and work with that. You can focus on the gestural transcript to focus on individual gestures. You can also look at both transcripts to see how they interact with each other. PC. Uh, and you can see the relationship between the two by looking at the pair of transcripts. Uh, and so, uh, so keeping separating these into separate transcripts actually made it easier to access the gestural layer that I was interested in the, in this particular uh, analysis. And a part of what we discovered was that, in fact, the two transcripts have very different timelines. There are times when the gesture and the speech are synchronized, but there are times when they're really operating quite separately and have very different timelines. And so being able to time code them separately ended up making the data much more accessible and making the whole process work a lot more smoothly. So this allows you to bring the visual into your analysis. It allows you to bring something behavioral into the analysis. It allows you to uh, bring observable layers into analysis. So if you want to analyze something like dance, you're obviously not going to use a verbatim transcript. You need to create uh, some, some sort of descriptive 
or representational transcript to do that. Um, but you can get much more out of your video than just the words. Um, uh, the different layers have different timelines, uh, and you can create your own system relatively easily to describe just about anything that is analytically meaningful to you. So don't be limited by thinking about verbatim transcripts, uh, try and think about transcripts more broadly. But obviously, it take, having additional transcripts gives you more detail, more power, but it also takes more time to create, so there is a little bit of a trade-off. Um, uh, a number of different systems allow you to drop images into your transcript, which can be really powerful. Uh, you can take screenshots from video uh, and drop them in, or you can take external images. If, you have, uh, if you're in a classroom, you can take photographs of the whiteboard or scans of student work, that kind of thing. It allows you to capture what can be very hard to put into words in a way that uh, really emphasizes visual points uh, in the transcript, and sometimes that is extremely useful. It's also really useful for publication, where you might talk about something visual that you can't really include a, a uh, video clip in uh, uh, in a publication, and the process of sending people out to a link is fraught with its own set of problems uh, and doesn't really work very well, particularly in the long term. Uh, but it's important to recognize that if your transcript is linked to the video, the video is right there, so you don't want to overuse bringing images in uh, because among other things, putting images into transcript uh, from a data standpoint, it, images are huge compared to text. And so it can slow down a number of processes in, in a number of different software packages. Uh, uh, and so there is a cost to pay for bringing in the images, but it's also important to recognize that a well-placed, well-selected, well-placed image can really enhance your transcript quite a bit uh, and make things uh, 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 particularly being able to make visual points is really important. I was working on some economic data at one point, uh, and one of the things I noticed was that in news pieces, when the BBC was talking about uh, the housing crisis as part of the 2008-2009 economic crisis that we were studying, um, all of the images they used when they were talking about the housing crisis were images from the U.S., there was a very clear, subtle implication in the visuals that they were choosing in those news pieces to imply that the housing crisis piece of things was something important from America, not homegrown uh, in the British Isles. Um, so we've talked about uh, different transcripts allow you to see the video differently. This is something that you can actually use uh, analytically to, you can leverage it to influence how you analyze your data. I was doing some work with uh, Erica Halverson. She had a, a set of student produced documentary videos. Um, and these are students who are uh, uh, academically at risk. So they were referred to this special summer program where they taught them filmmaking. And what she wanted to do was to make, uh, make it clear to of the school that in fact these kids were using a tremendous amount of subtlety and sophistication in their filmmaking that totally negated the fact that these children were uh, somehow uh, intellectually challenged or academically at risk. Uh, and so she created uh, four transcripts to represent uh, the director's view of the videos, the uh, sound engineer's view of the videos, the cinematographer's view of the uh, of the documentary, the film editor's view, and she was able to demonstrate the interplay between these different layers by having these four separate analytic lenses that they were looking at these transcripts uh, or looking at these videos with. Um, and so she, she was able to make selections from different transcripts to make different analytic points to show different types of uh, subtlety and, uh, and and excellent filmmaking from different points of view, but she was also able to make selections that showed overlap between them that showed how they were linked to time. Uh, and it's important to recognize that this was a very labor intensive process to create these different analytic views, but that it gave a level of power to the analysis that uh, uh, that she was not able to get with just a single transcript or a single view on uh, the data and it was able, uh, it enabled her to say things that were not easily said in terms of coming out with the analytic portion of this project 
um, uh, that worked really, really well. Uh, conversation analysis, discourse analysis, interaction analysis are all schools of uh, methodologies uh, are schools of, of, of analysis that put more detail into a transcript than a standard uh, verbatim transcript was. Uh, the main criticism of this process is that it's incredibly labor intensive. Uh, the number that keeps coming up when I talk with people who do Jeffersonian notation is that it takes as much as 60 hours to come up with a good uh, Jeffersonian transcript of a single hour's worth of video. Um, but those transcripts can be read analytically. They can be understood very, very quickly and very, very thoroughly and in very detailed ways because of all of the time that went in. So we have here a sample of a Jeffersonian transcript. Uh, they do things like time pauses because pauses are significant in language, including micro pauses, which are less than two tenths of a second long, which when this was developed, it was all timed with stopwatches, and that was the practical limit. Computers allow us to time pauses shorter than two tenths of a second more conveniently. Uh, you look at speech overlap and what that means about power dynamics and how conversation flows. There are symbols that indicate things like rising intonation, following in, falling intonation, uh, intakes of breath. Um, uh, there's extension where you stretch a word uh, and that has analytic meaning about conversation. There's emphasis. There's uh, uh, ways of indicating that speech is louder or quieter than the normal level of speech uh, that things are being emphasized. There's pacing. You can indicate that something is going spoken more quickly than surrounding text or spoken more slowly. There is latching where ideas and uh, fragments of speech are connected to each other across time and around surrounding things. There's also a level of uh, when you're transcribing, you often have passages that are not perfectly clear. There are several different ways of indicating your level of uncertainty with how well you have transcribed. So what you can see by the amount of red that is now on this transcript is that there's lots and lots of analytic meaning going into that transcription um, uh, and uh, and making sense out of all of that uh, additional data. Um, uh, phonetic transcription uh, is uh, another level of detail, basically using the International Phonetic Al Alphabet. I'm going to skip that. Okay, uh, one example of overlapping speech. This is some of the most extreme uh, overlapping speech uh, I have had to deal with from a transcriptional point of view, I was unable to come up with a single transcript representation to, uh, to deal with uh, the level of overlapping speech in a recent sample of video uh, that I collected. And I wanna show you how I ended up solving that by creating multiple transcripts, a different transcript for each of the speakers involved so that you can see the interplay of their speech as they're talking over each other. Uh, trigger warning, this is uh, a, one of the U.S. presidential debates uh, that uh, that occurred a couple of months ago, uh, and the, the, uh, while I've selected a portion that's really focused on the moderator, uh, there's a certain degree of unpleasantness uh, in uh, this, and I don't want to uh, give people uh, flashbacks, particularly if there are some Americans uh, in the audience here. But here's a little bit of transcript uh, demonstrating some of the worst overlapping speech I've dealt with. Uh, on health care, and then we'll come back to Roe v. Wade. All right, Mr. President, the Supreme Court will hear a case a week after the election in which the Trump administration, along with 18 state attorneys general, are seeking to overturn That's right. Obamacare, to end Obamacare. You have spent the last... Because they want to I, give good health care. If I may ask but my question, sir. Good health care. Over uh, the last four years, you have promised to repeal and replace Obamacare, but you have never in these four years come up with a plan, a comprehensive plan yes, to I replace have. Obamacare. Of course I have. 
Well, I got rid of the individual mandate. Excuse me. I got rid of the individual mandate, which was a big chunk of Obama. That is absolutely a big thing. That was the worst part of Obamacare. Chris, that was the worst part of Obamacare. Let me ask my question. Well, I'll ask Joe. The individual mandate was the most unpopular aspect of Obamacare. I got rid of it. And we will protect people. Mr. President, I'm the moderator of this debate, and I would like you to let me ask my question, and then you can answer. Go ahead, Fred. You. So my reaction watching that debate live the first time was, oh, my God, the poor people who have to transcribe this for the news services. Um, uh, uh, and uh, but this is uh, 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 that is an example of how one can use transcripts to get out of a very difficult situation uh, in terms of data that is challenging. So just uh, to summarize uh, for uh, some researchers, Transcription is a first pass at the data. They use transcription to familiarize themselves with their data. They can perform a broad stroke analysis in deciding what to transcribe and what level of detail to include. Uh, uh, when I go through my data and transcribe it, I will always create analytic memos about what ideas I want to follow up on when I shift into a more analytic process. Uh, but for some researchers, transcription is their primary analytic act. These are people who transcribe in a way that directly provides a foundation for theoretical understanding, such as using Jeffersonian notation for conversation or uh, discourse analysis. Uh, they're uh, researchers who operationalize layers of analysis through different transcripts that allow them to access their data in different analytic viewpoints. Uh, uh, and last but certainly not least, it's really important to recognize that no matter how detailed your transcripts are, the transcript is never a replacement for the media data underlying it. Uh, that is uh, a really important thing to keep in mind that uh, while transcripts are really, really useful, they are not a standalone solution. So I unfortunately have uh, gone way over the time that I was supposed to. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, send them to uh, uh, Christina and Sarah. Uh, you can also contact me directly through the information here. I hope that we have time at least for a couple of questions uh, here as we wrap things up. Um, uh, so I'll turn it over to Christina and Sarah to, 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 to finish. Sorry for running longer than I expected. Please don't worry, David. Thank you so very much. I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed that. It's perhaps the most comprehensive discussion of transcription I've come across recently, um, and it's going to make an absolutely excellent learning resource for all of us here today, and also for many who are going to access the recording. I'm certainly going to point many of um, the people I'm um, supporting to, to that, um, so thank you so much. Uh, and also the extent to which it struck a note with those of us attending today is really um, evidenced by the long list of questions that we've had, so you've really engaged and many of us here, we've got lots of questions. Now, unfortunately, we can't put all of these to David um, now, uh, but we are going to, to send um, David a big long list of them uh, and ask him uh, if he could kindly answer them. Uh, and we will post the answers along with um, the recordings of the of the of the video of the of the session today. So I'm just going to take uh, one of the questions. And um, as uh, as my kind of role as a chair, I've chosen this. Um, partly also uh, from the standpoint of the CACDAS networking project, um, because it kind of um, rings as an interesting um, point in relation to the use of software um, for uh, uh, analysis of materials that, um, that have transcripts associated with them. So the question um, that I've chosen um, is, so it's about multiple transcripts um, that you discussed, uh, David, of gestures and um, use of language. So where you've got multiple transcripts overlaying each other um, right. with gestures and use of language. Um, and the question is, wouldn't codes and queries make it possible um, to look for overlaps between gestures and particular language uses when there is an overlap and when there when there isn't. And the person who's asking this is wondering, what's the added benefit of multiple transcripts in that kind of a context? Uh, yes, absolutely. The codes will be your ultimate representation of that. For me, in my own work, in my own experience, I find it much easier to place those codes accurately if I have a gestural transcript to work from. That often the gestural transcript 
uh, is my first pass at the gestural layer so that I can, you know, I, I create my system, I represent, I figure out how I'm going to represent each of the different gestures involved, and I can then look over that list and see which gestures are the most important and which ones uh, are throwaways um, uh, so that it, it accumulates them for me. And I also use that transcript to define the start and the stop of each gesture so that I can code that gesture accurately for where it starts and where it stops. So the uh, uh, the transcript is a useful way of delineating the selection process for the coding process. It's also really useful for me when I'm trying to get that sort of, you take a step back and look at the overview of your data sometimes. So yeah, you've got the level where it's coded and that's a micro level. But when I'm making sense of data, I'll look at that micro level, but I'll also take a step back and look at the data from a bit further out. And when I'm doing that uh, sort of bigger picture look at the data, um, uh, what I find really useful is having the both transcripts showing up at the same time so that I can see how they play together in a different way than my coding map is going to show me um, the coding map tends to be focused on a micro level. The transcripts tend to be focused on a sort of broader level that makes uh, that allows me to see the data from several different uh, levels of intensity uh, and that helps me make connections in my mind as I'm understanding how those gestures fit in with the rest of what the video contains. Great, thank you so much for that. I think it, um, David's um, answer ties in a little bit also to a few of the other questions that we've had um, around kind of note taking and commenting and memos uh, and, and those um, sorts of activities um, alongside transcription. Um, and uh, so hopefully um, once we put these additional questions to David, those of you who um, have, have uh, asked those particular questions can also tie back to to the, the the answer he's just given now. Yeah, I, I guess the la the last comment that I would make is that the transcription is often my first pass yeah. at those and kinds of things, and that the coding would then be a second pass yeah. uh, at, at the level of detail. Uh, and so that, that that's the other piece of it. Yeah, so like a pre-coding exercise. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again for um, for providing us with such a stimulating um, hour. Um, I really enjoyed it and. We are going to put all of those questions that you've continued to post, thank you so much for that, um, to David, and you will be receiving um, uh, answers to those. Thank you so much for um, coming today to this webinar, and we will also be in touch with the list of webinars that are planned for, um, for the next uh, uh, year, the next calendar year, along um, with additional um, details in an email to you all. And I'm wishing you all um, a very, uh, good rest of your day wherever you happen to be and please do keep well. Looking forward to seeing you again soon on our uh, next webinars. Thanks so much again David. Okay bye bye now everyone.